right, all right. I don't know why I was channeling my best. Uh, what's that? It's not Owen Wilson. Who's the guy? Matthew McConaughey. There's the guy. Yeah, anyway. So speaking of Matthew McConaughey, one of the best accomplishments in cinematic film history is the movie Spaceballs. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know the movie Spaceballs, where have you been? Uh, it's a Mel Brooks film, and it's a parody of Star Wars. And so you have Rick Moranis, uh, a, a staple of 90s family comedy, uh, playing the, the Darth Vader type. He's, uh, uh, what, is it, what is it, Lord Helmet. And uh, then you have uh, Bill Pullman, uh, also kind of a staple of 90s movies, uh, playing uh, the Luke Skywalker Han Solo character. And at one point, they, they fight uh, with their Schwartz rings, uh, and, and they're, they're, they're dueling back and forth. And uh, somehow, uh, Darth Helmet, Lord Helmet, tricks uh, Lone Star into giving up his ring. And he starts ridiculing him and making fun of him and all of this stuff. And he's like, you can't believe how dumb you are. That's the oldest trick in the book. And then he says something that I often quote to my wife when we play board games and I win. Uh, he says, don't you know that evil will always triumph because good is dumb? <laughs> evil will always triumph because good is dumb. And, and it's funny, it's humorous, but when you're in the middle of something, I don't, I don't know where you're at in life right now, but, but there comes a season of your life where it feels like evil does actually always triumph. There's this sense that evil always seems to get the upper hand. It seems like things are getting worse. It seems like nothing is getting better. And it seems like to believe in good, to hope in good, to, to think that there's anything good out there seems kind of dumb, kind of naive, kind of childish. Whether you, you lose a job, you lose a loved one, you lose your health, you lose something, and you begin to question goodness and whether or not good can actually win out in the end. Now, we're walking through Job, we're studying the book of Job, and Job wrestles with this question uh, sort of in a very Job way of wrestling with this question. And so the way that we're going to talk about uh, evil today is from a very Job-specific perspective. So I want us to walk through what's called the problem of evil. And the problem of evil is basically three statements. God is all-powerful, God is good or all good, and there is evil in the world. And so they're saying, the, the, the theistic set, is that one of those three things has to not be true. Either evil really doesn't exist, or God is not all-powerful, otherwise he would do something, or he could do something about evil, and God therefore is not all good, because he would do something about evil. And so it wrestles, it's kind of a logical problem uh, that philosophers have worked with for, for centuries, and, and so we're going to address it today, and uh, before I get into it, I don't want you to think that we're going to, if you've had a freshman philosophy class and you're like, yes, the problem of evil, we're, we have 30 minutes for this. I'm not going to solve it for you today. So I'm going to set up some parameters. One, I'm not an expert philosopher. Two, uh, we're looking at it specifically from Job's perspective. So we're going to leave some things on the table, but if you want to talk more about it, of course you're welcome to come find me afterwards. Next steps, love to continue talking with you about the problem of evil, but we're looking at it specifically from Job's perspective. So what I want us to do is I want us to start with something that we all agree on, what I think most of us agree on which is that there's evil in the world. There's evil in the world. Most of us would agree with this. And, and, and evil is something that we see, we, we encounter, and, and philosophers really break evil out into a couple of different types of evil. There's what's called moral evil. Moral evil is what happens when morally responsible individuals decide to take morally wrong actions. Now, this happens to Job. Job is a victim of moral evil. It says in chapter 1 that at one point the Sabaeans and then the Chaldeans come and raid, take his livestock, kill his servants. That's moral evil. Taking what doesn't belong to you and killing people, in case you didn't know, is a moral evil. We see this all the time in the news. Like This is pretty much what news runs on, right? Moral evil. Murder, sexual assault, theft, war, violence, embezzlement, Name it, you've seen it on the news. If you don't believe in moral evil, you don't interact with other human beings really at all. You're a hermit, and so welcome for coming to our church today uh, and breaking your, your hermitage. So there's moral evil. There's also what's called natural evil. Natural evil happens when there's pain and suffering because of natural consequences or natural processes, right? So Job has this happen to him as well. It says one of his servants comes running to him and says, hey, we were just out in the fields and this big old lightning bolt came down and killed all your sheep. That's not anybody's fault. Uh, a whirlwind comes around, 
knocks over the house that his kids are eating in and his children all die, that's a natural evil, right? We encounter natural evil also quite frequently. You're going to leave today and you're going to look for some place to go have lunch. And one of you is going to have a great idea to go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and you're going to pull into the parking lot and it's going to dawn on you that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. That's not Jeff White's fault that they're closed on Sundays. That's nobody's fault. It's just a natural evil that you forgot that Chick-fil-A is closed. It's okay. They're open tomorrow. They're open tomorrow. Natural evils are natural disasters, hurricanes, thunderstorms, things like that uh, that take place. Even things like slipping when you get out of the bathtub. That's nobody's fault. You just didn't, you just slipped getting out of the bathtub. That's a natural evil. Then there's what's called gratuitous evil. And gratuitous evil is something that some people debate whether or not it really exists, but we're going to talk about it because it seems to happen to Job. These are things that are suffering so extreme and over the top that you begin to question whether or not anything good can come out of it. Job's gratuitous evil is the fact that all of this stuff seems to happen to him in what seems like about a week, maybe less. It's just piling on, right? For us, gratuitous evil, suffering of children, we would call that a gratuitous evil. Uh, genocides, the Holocaust, things like that, kind of a go-to example of uh, gratuitous evil. The bottom line is that very few people could actually argue, especially in Western culture, that evil it doesn't exist. It, it does exist. It's very real and apparent. So because there's much evil in the world, it leads you down to a path to begin to perhaps question whether or not God is powerful or God is good. So rather than doing a linear outline like we usually do, I want us to kind of do a choose-your-own-adventure and, and we're going to sit here and, and ask, well, what is, is it? Is it that God's not all powerful or is it that God's not all good? And then we're going to kind of land in a spot. So is God not all powerful? Is God not all powerful? This is and is not Job's problem. Okay, it is and it isn't Job's problem. Uh, it isn't Job's problem in that he is fully aware and conscious and believes in God's ultimate power and sovereignty. Right? He, he, it's all over the book of Job. You can't get away from the book of Job and not walk away without thinking that Job thinks God is very powerful. But it is Job's problem in that his understanding of God's power is much fuller and richer than many of those people around him, particularly the three friends who show up and want to give him counsel and, and encouragement uh, during that time. Right? One of those friends, his name is Eliphaz. Now, Eliphaz comes to Job, and the friends start off really great. They're just going to sit with him in silence for seven days and mourn with him. And then I think they got like me, and just the silence was killing them, and they just decided, i got to say something. i just got to say something. So Eliphaz is the first one to chime in, and he says in verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, he starts talking. And, or sorry, verse, chapter 4, he starts talking. Uh, and he's basically telling Job, look, man, you did something wrong, you did something wrong, you did something wrong. And then in chapter 5, he starts doing that great thing that you want people to do when you're really hurting and suffering. He offers advice, because that's what we need. He says in verse 8, as for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. Now, like I said, he spent the last chapter telling Job all the things he probably has done wrong, and then he strikes up the as for me. This is basically saying, well, if I were you, and if you're a husband in this room, and you've ever started a sentence like that, you then encountered a natural disaster yourself. <laughs> and you slept somewhere else that night. And he says this, he says, if I were you, I would go to God. I would go to God. I would plead with God. I would seek God's counsel. And the problem with what he's saying, or really the foundation of what he's saying, is he believes that God is so powerful that he can actually change and amend Job's circumstances. And he's not wrong. That's the problem with Job's friends. They're not wrong. They're just incomplete. Look at what he says. So he rattles off Bible verses. Let's go in verse 8. He says, As for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. And then he starts saying why. Who does great things and unsearchable marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who, are, who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their own craftiness and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noonday as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword of their mouth and from the hand of the mighty, so the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. 
Eliphaz is doing something that all of us have done or have had done to us. He's coming around somebody suffering, put his arm around him and said, for I know the plans that he has for you. Or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's just rattling off Bible verses. He believes them. Job believes them. But they're applied at a time and in a way that it isn't incredibly helpful. It comes across as condescending. It comes across as as kind of uh, uh, shallow in a way. Because Job takes this concept, this idea that God is all-powerful, and he kind of teases it out to a a more uh, impactful end. Look what he uh, says in, verse, in chapter 9. Uh, turn over to chapter 9, and Job responds to Eliphaz. Then Job answered and says, truly I know that it is so. So truly I know it's so that I can go to God and I can talk to him. But how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, with God, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. So what he's saying is, God is so powerful that if I were to go and plead my case before God, do you legitimately think I would have a chance? It'd be like if all of us decided we were going to put a football team together and we were going to go challenge the Patriots. How are we going to do? Probably not good. That's what Job is saying. He keeps going. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? He who removes mountains and they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger. Who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble? Who commands the sun and it does not rise? Who seals up the stars? Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the chambers of the south? Who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number? Behold, he passes by me and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. him. Behold, he snatches away. Who can turn him back? Who will say to him, what are you doing? Job is saying, you want me to go to that God, that all-powerful, strong, mighty God, impactful, world-changing, world-creating God, and you want me to argue with him about why this has all happened to me. You are out of your mind. And if you've ever been in a situation where all control of your life has kind of been sucked out of you or control has been, been removed from you, you know a little bit of how Job feels. I mean, think about being completely out of control, and you have to rely on God totally for your safety and security. Some of you might feel this when you put your 16-year-old child in a car and they drive away for the first time by themselves. You can't mash the brake for them. You can't turn the wheel for them. You are trusting God. You are totally out of control when that happens. You might feel this for the first time when somebody tells you that you're not able to have children. What, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? Or when you it enters your mind for the first time that maybe I'm not going to get married. You feel out of control. Or when you're told that your life is going to change because of an illness or an injury that you have, and you're not going to be able to do some of the things that you've always done. What am I going to do? How am I supposed to turn? And some people in those instances might be like Job's buddy Eliphaz and come to you and say, hey, you just need to trust God in the middle of this. You need to trust him for this. And you're going to say, yeah, I get it. I know that he's all powerful and that he can do all things. I get it. But I don't even have a leg to stand on, and God seems way further away than he ever felt before. And that puts you into a really strange place that Job goes to, because we we come into this precipice, and we ask ourselves if if God is all-powerful. And the Bible is very clear, and Job's very clear, that not only is he all-powerful, he's incredibly powerful, more powerful than we could possibly imagine. And so we back away from that and we say, well, if God's all-powerful and he's capable of fixing the circumstances that I'm in, does that then mean that he's not all good? Does that mean that he just doesn't love me? Does that just mean that he doesn't care? And that takes us to the next question, the next statement. Is God not all good? And I think this is a little bit more in line with Job's problem. He affirms that God is powerful. He knows that he is. But there's this hint of doubt that starts creeping into his mind just a little bit about whether or not God is good. Is God just this all-powerful dictator and not a benevolent one? Is God just pulling the strings and is arbitrary and doesn't care? Now, Scripture is full of statements declaring God's goodness. It's all over the place. But like I said, I want us to walk through this from Job's perspective Because if I just run to a passage about how God is good and we don't walk through the details with Job, 
If you're in a situation right now where you're questioning God's goodness, that I'm going to sound like Eliphaz. That's the last thing that we need to do today. So Job is really struggling. And the, the neat thing about Job's struggle is that he kind of does what I call, uh, he acts like a whale. Uh, if you know anything about a sperm whale, sperm whales de- delve really deep into the depths of the ocean, and, and they hunt their prey there, and then they come back up to the surface to breathe. And they can stay in the depths for a really long time, but they always come up and get air, and then they dive back down. Job is kind of like this in his thoughts about God. He's plumbing the depths of darkness. His soul, his relationship to God, the problems of the earth, he's down there, and he's pulling out everything. He is struggling in the darkness. But every once in a while, he pops up like a whale, and he makes about a six, seven, eight verse statement about the goodness of God, or the greatness of God, or how he trusts God, and then you're like, and we've lost him again, and he's back down. You know? and, and if you've ever walked through a difficult season in life, you know that's how it actually is. You'll have a good day where you're like, man, I really feel good today. I'm trusting the Lord. Like if you've ever battled, battled depression or anxiety or something like that, you're like, man, today's a good day. I, I'm really trusting the Lord. And then the next day you're like, I can't get out of bed. And so Job is a very realistic individual. And we'll see this in chapter 10. Look at chapter 10, verse 8. He makes sort of this statement about God's goodness. He says, your hands fashioned and made me, and now you've destroyed me altogether. Remember that you have made me like clay, and will you return me to the dust? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? You clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and steadfast love, and your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you hid in your heart. I know that this was your purpose. Job is conscious of God's goodness. He believes in it. But this is smack dab in the middle of a discussion about how in despair and how difficult things are for Job right now. This is what makes him so realistic and so believable. That's why people turn to the book of Job when they're struggling. So Job is questioning God's goodness, but cognitively he believes in the goodness of God. Experientially, he's not feeling that. And so that creates tension in his life. Okay, I know God is good. I believe God is good. I've been told God is good, and I've even experienced God's goodness in my life. But right now kind of stinks. And if your faith is, is damaged, or if your faith is, is weak or tenuous, that amount of tension can break it. Job's faith, we see, is not weak. It bends, but it doesn't break. Because Job has done the hard work during these times of good times, of still trusting in the Lord, of still ascribing to the Lord glory, of still turning to the Lord, so that when these days come, his faith doesn't break. It just bends. And it bends pretty far. But it just bends. And this is where there's a young man who steps up. There's always a young guy. There's always a young man who's like, let me tell you something. And this is Elihu. Elihu is a young man. So there's sort of these debates between uh, the older men, Job's three friends, and himself, and they go back and forth. And then they get quiet, and this young man named Elihu steps in. And he's all fired up. He's like, man, somebody's got to come in here and defend God's honor. Somebody's got to step up and set these old guys right, is basically what he's saying. And he makes two arguments for the goodness of God in chapter 33 and chapter 34. And you can turn over there uh, right now. The first one is that he argues that pain is a good thing because it shows us that God is good. Pain's a good thing because it shows us that God is good. Look at verse 19. Sorry, 33, 19 to 26. I'm in the Psalms. That's why that doesn't look right. I'm like, wow, that's not even remotely close. 19, here we go. Man is rebuked with pain on his bed and with continual strife in his bones, so that his life loathes bread and his appetite the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. His soul draws near to the pit, and his life to those who bring death. So this man is, is, is this sort of figurative man, is, 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 had bad things happen to him, he's suffering. And then Elif, uh, Elihu says, If there be a, for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand, to declare to man what is right for him, and he is merciful to him and says, Deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then the man prays to God, and he accepts him, and he sees his face with a shout of joy, and he restores to man his righteousness, 
And he sings before men, and he says, I sinned and perverted what was right, and it was not repaid to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down to the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. Elihu's saying that God is good in providing pain because it's in pain that we might turn and seek treatment. Right? Now, a practical way of looking at this is if I go and I, my wife is, is boiling some tea and I go and grab the kettle and I burn myself, I, I reach back and I'm like, ow, now that's a good kind of pain because it teaches me don't touch a hot kettle, which I should already know at this point at 35. <laughs> pain is good. If I didn't have pain in that instance, I'd grab it, I'd pick it up, I'd pour my tea, and I would have this horribly mauled hand. Pain is good for that. Now, in Elihu's statement, he's saying that pain is also good on a spiritual side because as we encounter difficulty, as we encounter evil, as we're overwhelmed in some cases by feelings uh, and oppression of evil, we then turn to God. We run to God and we say, God, help us, bail us out, save us, rescue us. And that's not entirely wrong. In fact, there's some truth there. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes God allows things to happen to us so that we seek him out. But that's not all the time, and that's certainly not the case in Job's life. It's an incomplete answer. It's an incomplete answer. He continues his argument in chapter 34. He says that basically, God, you just need to trust that God is good, and you need to shut up asking questions. Look at verse 10 of chapter 34. Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding. Now, he's talking to uh, the, the older guys in the room. He's saying, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to the work of a man, he will repay him, and according to his ways, he will make it befall him. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? If he should set his heart to it and gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. He's saying that God is basically good because he allows anything to exist at all. And God can choose to do whatever he wants with that creation and not lose any of his goodness. And again, there's some truth here. God is good. And God is a good creator. And therefore, a good creator makes good things. Right? In, in, in the book of Genesis, you start in chapter 1 and you start reading. It says, and he made such and such and such and such. And he, behold, it was good. He made good things. The earth is good. And Elihu's saying that because of that, you really can't challenge God, which is a problem because that's exactly what Job wants to do. And that's exactly what Job has been wanting to do and complaining about. And the rest of scripture actually seems to indicate that we can go to God. That we can beat our breast at God. We can say, God, I'm angry about this. I don't like it. And I want you to do something about it. Scripture seems to be very clear. Again, I accidentally wound up in the Psalms. You should wind up in the Psalms too. Because that's a lot of Psalms. God, why are you, how long are you going to let this go on? Aren't you going to do something about this? And so again, Elihu's not wrong. That's the problem with Job's friends and Elihu. They're not 100% wrong. They're actually right in a lot of things. It's just incomplete. It's just incomplete. Now, you may be in a position today where you're questioning God's goodness. You may know in the, in kind of in the back of your head that Mark 10, 18 says no one is good but God alone. You may know Romans 8, 28, all things work together for, God, for the good of those who love him. You might even know 1 Timothy 4, 4, where it says everything created by God is good. But none of that may help you because it doesn't feel like God is good. It might not feel like he's good. And so we wind up here at the end of these three statements. Uh, there's evil, God is all good, God is all powerful. And we kind of come to the, the, the crux of things. Are we going to believe that God is all good and all powerful and that there's a purpose for evil or are we going to allow evil to win out and destroy the faith that we have? I would encourage you not to do that. Now, at the risk of coming across like one of Job's three friends, I want to encourage you to have faith in God and his purposes. I want to encourage you to have faith, that, that the answer to this is a, is a faith-based answer. And I, I'm going to walk through, uh, as we close, as we kind of walk through this last point, I want us to walk through kind of some defenses for the problem of evil, philosophical defenses, and I'll outline what they are as we go, but see how they have practical application for you as you encounter evil on an everyday basis, okay? So we want to have faith 
in God and his purposes. Look at Job 19. Go back with me to Job 19. It's the one time my pages stick together. There you go. In the midst of Job's suffering and his lament, there comes a statement that he makes. And it's pretty much right here in the middle of the book. He says in 19 verse 23, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. This is another one of those whale moments. It's one of those moments where, where Job kind of pops up and he, he kind of has a breath of fresh air. And he's putting forth this concept, this idea of faith. That we have to believe that at the end of all things, at the end of the day, there's something happening that is beyond my sight and beyond my perception. So let's walk through what he says and see if we can find some application. First, we need to have faith that our earthly dealings matter. We need to have faith that our earthly dealings actually matter. Look at verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. Job is wanting these words written down, which is great because they were. He wants them written down because he wants future generations to see two things. One, he wants people to know he didn't quit, that he didn't give up, that he held on to his faith even when everybody around him was like, man, you did something wrong or you just need to curse God and die. But two, he wants things to be written down so that people that come after him can know that evil doesn't win. And so what you do in life, one of the the philosophical defenses of the problem of evil is that there's free will in the world. And because there's free will, people have moral actions that they can choose. They can choose good or they can choose evil. And when they choose evil, it introduces evil into the world. And you can look at Genesis 3 and see that with Adam and Eve. But if that means that evil can be encouraged through our free action, that can also mean that good can be encouraged through my free choice. When I choose to do certain things, I can either be an ally of evil or I can be an ally of good. I can be an ally of God. And so when I choose to do certain things, I'm either pushing back the darkness or I'm standing aside and letting it come on in. And this is one of the reasons why we do serve days here at Park Cities. It's why we, next month, every weekend in October, we have serve days For you to go together and be together with other people and push back the darkness. We don't do it so we can get cool Instagram posts of us wearing these cool shirts. We're fighting evil. And Paul tells us our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, principles, powers, all that stuff. There's a fight to be had. And if you stay at home on your couch every single one of those four days, watching college football or whatever it is that you do on a Saturday, you're letting evil win. You're letting evil have its way in the world when you could be pushing back the darkness. So push it back. It's not just on serve days. It's everything you do. It's when you, you forgive your spouse. It's when you, when you love your family. It's when you are a good employee at work and you bring glory to the name of God. You're showing that darkness doesn't win. So push it back. Use your choices. Use the, the moral choice that God has given you to push back the darkness. We are to combat evil every day that we are alive. So we need to have faith that our earthly earthly dealings matter, even if we can't see the result. We also need to have faith that God will win. We need to have faith that God will win. Look at verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. This is, I think, the best verse in Job, personal opinion. Because there's no way that Job says this on his own. This is the Lord clearly speaking through him pointing us to the cross, pointing us to Christ. Because how often do we say our Redeemer lives, our Redeemer lives, our Redeemer lives? Job is making two statements here. He's saying, one, for I know that my Redeemer lives, which means my Redeemer, God, has not been defeated. But then he also says, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, which if God's the last one standing, what does it mean about evil and death and sin? It means it's not standing. It means it's been defeated. 1 Corinthians 15 is very clear that God wins out. And the way that God wins out is through the cross. One man who did nothing wrong suffers unjustly. The newer and better Job, Jesus Christ, suffers for sins he did not commit and pays the penalty for our sins. 
And when we believe in him, we get on God's team. We join the good team and fight against evil. That is what happens in the cross when we believe. And Jesus, even though he died, even though all evil was done to him, he resurrects, he comes to life again. Confirming for you and for me that his death, his sacrifice was accepted. And confirming again and again every day that he is alive, and he is alive, a redeemer lives, that evil doesn't win. At the end of the story, evil loses. It's thrown into a big lake of fire. That's how the story ends. Spoilers. And God rules and reigns forever with those that he bought with his blood. You can have that relationship. You can believe in that today. You can, you can move today. You can join up with those of us who believe in the cross and believe that God is all good and all powerful and he shows his goodness and he shows his power by beating death as its own game. You wouldn't think you would beat death by dying, but he does. And he shows that he's more powerful and better than we could possibly imagine. So we need faith. We need faith that God wins out in the end. But we also need to have faith. We need to have faith that my suffering is going to produce growth. Look at verse 26. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes will behold and not another. My heart faints within me. Job is clearly hoping that at some point he's going to have a face-to-face conversation with God about this. Now, at the end of the book, he does. But I think here, Job is believing that he's going to die, and there's some kind of, of afterlife experience that Job is expecting. Job is expecting heaven, possibly even a resurrection, depending on where he is in sort of revelational thought at this point. And so Job is believing. He's going to confront God about all this one day. And he's saying, I know that somehow, some way, God's going to put a bow on this. He's going to figure this out for me, and I'm going to have some answers somehow, some way. And one of the answers that Scripture gives us about suffering in our lives is that somehow it's producing in me goodness. It's making me more like Christ. And in some way that's mystical that I don't quite understand, and I don't think anybody really does, is we're joining in Christ's suffering. So the Bible says that when we suffer, particularly when we suffer for our faith, you are somehow joining in in Christ's afflictions. Paul says as much in uh, Colossians uh, 1. He says, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Wait, there's something lacking in Christ's afflictions? Again, I don't know how that works, but apparently that's a part of, of evil's role in the world. That is how God is redeeming the evil in our world. It's making us more like Christ. It's shaping us and growing us. And it hurts. And it's rough and it stinks. And I get that. But if it's it's not senseless. It's not purposeless. Even Job, who's having the worst day ever, recognizes that God is doing something bigger. So as you suffer, the loss of a job, a broken home, a broken body, a crushed spirit, regrets, dreams that never materialize, hopes that are dashed before they're really ever conceived. As you go through all of this, as you look at the news and you look at our kind of divided world and our angry world, our violent world, and you think, God, what are you doing? We have to have faith. We have to have faith that God will win. We have to have faith that God is working. We need to have faith somehow, some way, it is cultivating in me and cultivating in others something else. Look, I know evil exists. I know it's overwhelming. It can feel overwhelming. And sometimes when it hits you really close to home, it can feel like you're just an island by yourself. There's a quote by Charles Spurgeon that says, I've learned to love the wave that throws me into the rock of ages. There will be a wave, if there hasn't been already, that will throw you somewhere. Where are you going to let it throw you? Because there's a rock, there's a stone, there's a cornerstone of Christ. And we know that if we turn to him, if we go to him in the midst of our pain, even in anger, and say, God, why is this happening to me? He will answer because he entered into our pain. He entered into our suffering. He didn't just stand off and watch it happen. No. Christ came, he dwelt among us, and he comes to make the weak strong. He died so that we might live. He's our cornerstone. So what do you hold on to? So as the band comes up to play and and, and to lead us in a a moment of reflection and and sort of, you probably are wrestling with something or, or, or will wrestle with something at some point. 
What do you think God is asking you to do today? Maybe it's to come to know him for the first time. Maybe it's to set aside kind of your problem of evil, your personal problem of evil, and trust that he has a greater purpose. Maybe it's to join the fight here at Park Cities. Like, hey, join us. This is our little unit of evil fighters. We would love to have you. Come help us. Help us push back the darkness and help us give glory to God because he uses us to do that. So let's pray together. Father God, you are good to us. You are merciful to us. You are powerful beyond measure. And you have done and are doing great things even when we can't see them. It may seem like evil is winning. It may seem like evil has the upper hand. But it doesn't. It's still early. You're still working. And so, Lord, we trust you. We have our faith in you. And even I pray that you, would, you're through your spirit, would give us the ability to say that. If, if there's somebody in this room who just can't say that right now, I pray that you would give them strength through your spirit. Empower them to believe because we can't do it in and of ourselves. And so, God, we trust you. We hold fast to you, and we love you. And we pray all this in your son's name.